thank you for joining ProBox uh, webinar about selling on, on Europe. I'm super excited. I'm Amit, the founder of ProBox. Uh, today we brought great speakers, great speakers and great friend, uh, super well known in the industry. So Nick, nice to meet you. Hi, pleasure to meet you. Yulia as well. Matt, pleasure to have you on board as well. Uh, for those people that are join our webinar, so uh, if you have some questions, so eventually we'll give like about five to 10 minutes in the end of the session for any questions that uh, you guys have. So you can drop the question under the chat box. And uh, without further ado, let's start the webinar. So let's start with uh, making some intro. Uh, to those speakers that have joined us today. So Nick, Nick Panev, Nick is the partnership manager and webinar host of HelloTax and the co-founder of Extreme Power Brands. Nick and his partner develop and launch uh, 20 plus private label supplement brands across Europe. Uh, Nick, super uh, Nick exited his brands in 2020 and since then he rebranded Extreme Power Brands into a partnership as a service agency for e-commerce service providers. Uh, Nick and his team helps these companies to grow through partnership in the e-commerce space. Yulia, okay. Yulia Balinova. Uh, I met Yulia, by the way, I think three times the past, like last, last, just, just the past month. So Yulia is the founder of Zignify Global Product Sourcing and the co-founder of two Amazon brands. Yulia speaks at conferences and events and provides content. A consulting utilizing her 17 years of experience in global product sourcing, supply chain, logistics, import, export, and the e-commerce field. Prior to finding Zignify, she held the position of managing director Russia of a German unicorn startup, Flexibus, Julia? Flexbus. Uh, For those living in Europe and in US will actually know it because they bought great, well, not bought Greyhound in US, but uh, acquired a stake. They yeah. don't need to read the rest. I have uh, 18 years old lady experience in sourcing. That's yeah, enough I, to know. I, I can say I can say that uh, like her, her like her speeches at the conferences like one of the magnificent and it's super super valuable information. So everyone that see you in some conferences highly highly recommended. And Matt uh, Matt has 17 years of in the e-commerce most. Uh, most of that focused on marketplaces management and growth, having witnessed the rise and the fall of many challenges. Channel, sorry, he co-founded co Rich Insight Eager to help brands all over the world uh, realize their potential with multi-channel service and tragedies on Amazon and 150 global channels. Myself, I'm the founder of Probox. Uh, Probox. Okay. Basically, our freight forwarder, digital freight forwarder, helping Amazon sellers to grow, uh, to streamline, support growth and profitability using the most friendly user e-commerce digital experience these days. And we have Steph here. Yeah, yeah, Steph. No, all right. Let's start with the webinar. So. Selling in Europe, why? I can answer the question because Europe is good Don't for vacation, but it's good. <laughs> no, no, no. So come, come in Europe for a vacation right now. You're going to like it that much. They're going to decide that it's going to be a good place to do business. And the reason is people don't come here because they think it's hard, but they're missing you know, the huge potential and the huge market. I'll I'm going to give you a few, few numbers and I'm going to let you in Matt. Uh, give their feedback for that. You know, we have 750 million people in Europe. 450 of those are over 18, which means potential buyers. If we're talking only for Amazon, only 2% of Amazon US companies are selling on Amazon Pan EU, which means that 98% of your competitors are not selling here. I mean, I, I don't, I think I can stop the webinar and just leave. This number should convince anybody who is not selling in Europe to go ahead and at least try that. But of course, you're going to say, okay, what tells? I mean, there might be some catch. I mean, actually, there is no catch. I mean, the difference is that there is multiple markets, it's fragmented. So people think that uh, you need to do a lot of stuff to 
ex actually expand there. But the truth is, you need one VAT to sell across the whole European Union. But I'm not going to go deeper into everything. I'm going to let Yulia, Matt, and Amit give you some tips on what, why they think this is, you know, why they think that you should expand Europe. Because we're going to uh, review other reasons why you should do that. If I might, uh, we actually sell in Europe since 2014. We started the first brand whilst we were still living in China and second one a few years ago. And most of the brands are actually just being sold uh, pan EU. So in Europe, we will be expanding with the second brand to the US simply because the pie of the market is so much bigger in comparison to Europe. So I can tell you this, selling in Europe in general, if you're selling in US already, coming into Europe is a good idea because competition here is uh, lower. There are not so many people who are actually selling. There's tons of people who are selling on Amazon, don't get me wrong. But the competition is not of a good quality. Uh, for example, in Europe, you don't have as many events as you have in US. You don't have mastermind classes. Uh, people are less connected with one another, so, so they don't actually see the level at which they should be in order to be, you know, extremely competitive and sell better than others. So the market is not that yet fragmented. So if you have enough stamina, you have the knowledge and you listen to different types of webinars, watch YouTube videos, attend events, you have a very good shot at selling in Europe and actually making money. Um, I know tons of sellers personally who are six, seven, eight, tons of seven and eight figure sellers who are just selling in Europe for example, just in Germany. They're not even doing pan-EU. They're doing, for example, just Germany or just UK. And especially if you're selling in the US, launching in the UK market as a test market, even though Brexit happened, is still a good idea. We've seen a lot of people move from US to UK and they have good quality returns. Let's put it this way. So I've seen a lot of success and it's just getting developed. Because Amazon in Europe in general is not as developed as it is in US with many technical things in the background. So it's just a lot of things to come and a lot more people are starting to buy online in general. Yeah. Right. Well, do I need to say anything more? I think everyone's said enough about why uh, Europe is a good place to be. Um, I think I would just add it's a very mature market. Being in the Western world, it's where a lot of uh, wealth is placed. So, you know, it's it's got a mature audience for e-commerce experience. It's got good infrastructure for support. It's, it's you know, very, very mature environment for where you can transact with your consumer. And they usually have extra money to spend online and they're willing to buy higher price purchased items. So all things considered, if you're going to grow a brand and try and get more revenue, You've got the US, you've got Europe, and you've got a few other territories, and Europe is one of the big places to focus on. So I'll just keep it as simple as that. Great. So I will just hi guys, for I'm one sorry. second. Uh, Steph, yeah. Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, to guys, I, had a, I, was, I, I had an issue, uh, apparently, um, but I'm, I'm here now a bit late, but uh, I'm going to make sure I will recover the period. Um, did I miss anything? Do you want me to say, share anything? No, I, I just like I will bypass maybe the the intro about uh, yourself. Go on, like if you have some insight why you're selling on Amazon in Europe, so give us your insight there. Uh, well, there are a lot of reasons. Um, uh, it is uh, growing almost uh, forty percent faster than the U.S. market. They are active now in five, uh, until two years ago, they were active in five countries. In the last four years, they opened four others. So they almost doubled the number of countries. They're building warehouses throughout Europe. So Amazon Europe will outgrow Amazon US over time. And I think everybody has now first movers advantage. If you're already selling in the US, then obviously with your reviews and everything, uh, basically like relaunching Amazon again, but you know the game. So I think for a mature brand, this is the biggest opportunity uh, to start growing because if you don't start expanding, you basically, and you want to grow your business or you're going to spend more money on marketing. So that's just, you know, lots of money, sort of. Or you need to uh, come up with uh, product launches. 
and that's also going to cost time and money. So what my suggestion always is, if you have a mature product, if you have an ASIN that's successful, make sure you start expanding and exploit your product to the fullest potential. Great. So I have a question. Like you talk, you all guys talk about Europe like as like a country or a continent, but Europe basically is divided to multiple countries. Like just today, I had a webinar with uh, Ben Leonard. Uh, I'm sure you usually know him. Uh, so he explained basically he started selling on, on Amazon in UK and then he expanded to the rest of the Europe. So what is the difference between selling the UK to Germany, to Italy, to France, if there is a difference between those countries? Yeah, I think, I think you've raised a very good point there. And, and I, think it's, I think people outside of Europe, they look at Europe and they think it's one collective. And actually to sell in Europe is not to sell in one area, it's to sell in a plethora of different countries. Each one of those countries has very different requirements, different market share opportunities, different key channels. And I think we're talking about Amazon here, but Amazon is not dominant in most of Europe. Most of Europe is dominated by local players and other channels in their areas. So to sell into Europe is not to sell just on Amazon across a multiple of channels because I think, as you rightly pointed out, there's, there's several Amazon regions, Steph. Most of them are very underdeveloped and there's, there's very little traction. There's very little sales opportunity there. So it's good to get there. It's an early advantage. But really, uh, you need to look at Europe per channel. And I think what we help brands do is we help find the right regions and the right channels so that they can hit the round running and be profitable rather than spreading themselves too thin and uh, not recognizing their opportunities. To just expand into Germany is, is a very different approach, a different strategy about the product type, the branding, the price point, the product vertical, um, as opposed to France or Spain, which are just very different markets, different regional players and very different considerations that you need to account for. So I think it's a very good, very good point. Europe is a group of very different places and each one has to be examined differently. And there are some commonalities between them, but generally speaking, you don't target Europe, you target countries in Europe, and you should have a strategic plan on which countries are the best ones to go after based on a number of criteria that come through an analysis perspective. Yeah, exactly. Just to add something with Matt, that's why the thing that we didn't mention so far is before you expand to Europe, you need to do your own research. Because if you're selling in the States, you might be surprised that you might not even have any competitors in Europe in some markets. So, and if in some markets you have a lot of competitors, you might skip them at the beginning. But because it's fragmented, you might spread your, like, uh, your actually sales across multiple smaller markets, but you can actually make more profit compared to what you would do in the States, for example. So, do your research, see what your competitors are doing. And like Matt said, Amazon is not the only one, there is a lot of markets. I was selling myself in Europe for 10 years and I was making the most, the highest profit and the most money in markets which are smaller. As a matter of fact, I never sold in Germany and the UK, but we did over eight figures, you know, at the peak. And we never went to the, like, to the largest markets because we knew that small markets mean people disregard those because they think they're too small. It doesn't make sense, but actually this is not right. And that's why, like, Matt said, look into each one separately. And this is actually a good thing because many of your competitors are going to say, okay, it's too hard. I'm not going to try it because it's hard. That, that's why people who try and succeed, they have higher profits compared to other markets, which are easier. Exactly. To expand on what Matt and Nick actually said. So what Nick is saying is you have higher barrier, uh, Matt as well, you have higher barrier to entry when you're coming into Europe. And this is because of Yes, we have kind of one market, kind of pan EU, but when you start selling there, whatever a French person will buy, a German might not, and the person right. from the UK. So it's a lot of localization, which actually gives a higher barrier to entry, meaning a lot of your competitors will actually fall off, which will give you kind of a first mover advantage where you're the first in the market and you can grab the piece that you require. And here where localization comes in, right? A lot of people just have, you know, this automatic translations for the listings, automatic keywords and all of that stuff. Yeah. For the beginning that you have the listing, it's okay. 
but then you actually need to localize everything because uh, yeah, it's very different from the automatic AI translation to what the, an actual person will do. That's why even you do things with AI, you still need a human to check it because there's a few things, emotional things that are missing. So Absolutely. that makes don't, it don't, so how, how, how do you do it? Basically, robots. Matt, how do you do it? Like, let's say I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm a seller from Germany and I want to start selling in Italy now. What what is the step you suggest like those sellers to try? Because eventually you need to change the copy of the listing. You need to understand the mentality of the people and so on. So what is the step you suggested here to the people in order to like verifying the country and the people in order to like optimizing the, the listing uh, in that sense? Um, well, well, we've been building a methodology for the last eight years on how to answer that question. Uh, and, you know, I think the broad strokes of it are first do an examination of your your brand penetration and, and whether or not it's got an audience, taking a look at the competitors, then just doing some broad strokes on the key channels and saying, well, how much traffic is going through that key category that I'm going to list on? What are the top players doing in that category? What's their revenue? What's their what's you know, how many units are they pushing per month? What's their average price point? And so from there, you're already getting some market and uh, understanding of how big the picture is, how many people are buying items like your item and what you should expect in terms of a total market. And, and then from there, you can figure out, well, what would be my year one market share? What would be my year two market share? And then that suddenly becomes a, a, a number, a, a money, a monetary value you can you can focus on. And then that helps justify, obviously, the costs, because to sell into Europe, usually you've got to localize stock. You do have to get translations. You can't rely. I completely agree with, with Julia. You can start with machine translations, but your listings are going to sound really silly to native speakers in right. a lot of situations and sometimes just just completely nonsensical. Um, that's not going to help you rank. That's not going to help you with your PPC. So there's an investment requirement of the stock localization, the, the, the translations, also just the key channels. If I'm focusing, if uh, to your point, if I'm a German seller and I'm focusing on moving into France, depending on the vertical, if it's fashion, if it's cosmetics, if it's electronics, I've got very different channels to consider in France. You know, if, if it's in electronics, I'm thinking probably more FNAC, you know, and, and if, it, if it's more, I don't know, fast fashion or something quite simple and and sort of medium tier priced, I'm probably thinking C discount and probably Amazon and eBay too. Um, so, you know, it's it's very dependent on all of the variables and criteria you put into it to what the output should look like. And it, it all just depends on not just that product, your price points and what the market is saying in terms of the analysis and the raw data, which, you know, doesn't lie. We're, we're very data driven. We, we follow the data. Um, it's a question of appetite, too. What's your budget? Are you looking for a year one branding expansion? Does it need to have an immediate ROI? So. All these things come together, and then that's what produces an outcome. And for anyone out there who's looking to figure all of this out for themselves, I would simply start with the macro data and go down from there, get an idea of how big the market is, then try and consider, well, what percentage of that market is realistic for me to acquire? And of that percentage, where do I break even? Where do I turn a profit based on the investment I've got to put in to localize myself into that market, then it becomes quite clear what your key territories are and what your top channels are. Steph, any additional information about it? No, uh, I agree with everybody. Uh, there is no such thing as a human being strategy. Uh, when you see this basically also when you see somebody hiring an Amazon manager, you already know it's going to be a failure because you need different expertises. Now, a lot of people want to sell on Amazon, everybody wants to make money, but it is quite complex to do the uh, operational complexity of it all, specifically when you cross borders, the different currencies, tax levels, etc. Right. So my, my suggestion is similar. Start with, uh, start with first checking where's the biggest market, or which market is at least big enough, and then start then thinking back, how can I set up the operation instead of the other way around? So what a lot of, as an example, a lot of US companies say, let's go to the UK because they speak the language. All that for me is like, you know, it's, it's funny. I mean, if the market is not there, why are you spending so much time and money? 
So uh, first figure out where the market is, then uh, make the plan back. And once you have that plan, you can start uh, start building. But yeah, you need some expertise and you need some data for sure. Cool. So uh, let's talk margin now. So we all know that Amazon seller struggles now. The margin being decreased a lot, especially in the US. What is the situation in the European market in terms of margin? Is it better, worse compared to the US? Give us some insight there. Well, I thought it was fascinating that, that most of the revenue in the US is only from the 15,000 top sellers at the moment in, in Amazon. And I think that's indicative of a market that's becoming much harder to tap into for new brands. The good news is that Europe is um, to a degree quite a bit more fragmented. And a lot of the analysis is we do when we look at categories, the majority of the category is usually in our other category, which is really a mixture of brands over 40 to 50%, which basically says that there's there's definitely a lot more opportunity. But um, I don't know, margin's a tricky topic to speak about generic, generally, I guess. It depends on the product. It depends yeah. on the, the company. Um, you know, you're probably, you probably you want to have a healthy margin. You don't want to focus on sales. And I, I would just say um, there's a, too many sellers out there. They focus on growing their sales at the expense of their margin. And I don't think there's a lot of sense in shifting more units and being more busy when you're not making any more money for it. So yeah, sell, because you're just recycling. Yes, exactly. So 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 tell sell ten units nicely profitably versus 100 units for for a tiny percent any day of the week as a seller in europe and as a person who also works with a lot of sellers in europe you see a trend that um you have a trend that people are moving away from cheaper products to more expensive items where you can have higher margins so they would rather sell less units but they would rather have a better markup, a better buffer, right? Because the uh, God knows what's going to happen with shipping again, another war, et cetera, et cetera. So everyone wants, uh, wants a higher buffer. And uh, what we see in our customers and even in our products, we have a few items where the margins are an absolute disaster. Either it's a disaster, but this product leads people to buy the product that has an absolute tremendous success in terms of a margin, right? So you kind of keep it and you kind of balance it out. So uh, even though you might not sell them as a bundle, but most people, they buy the first product and okay, you know, no margin, but then they see the second and together you actually are doing well. So you need to consider those things as well. Um, so again, we work with a lot of seven and eight figure sellers and smaller guys as well in um, Europe. And uh, yes, it is still possible to have good margins. And uh, on average, what we see, honestly, they're kind of, similar to US, maybe a tiny, weeny bit higher on some of the things in the categories that are a little bit more uh, different than from US. Like, uh, this is not an actual example, but let's say electric cattle is not that is something very popular in the United States, right? People don't have electric cattles because this is not a product for them. Whereas in Europe, this is a category which is massive and you have so many different items. So something that is more localized can have a higher margin uh, on the market in comparison that comes from abroad and is not very well known. And yeah. just to add one more thing, when you have a higher profit, I mean, higher, like higher, higher, higher value product, you know, you have less copycats because it would be risky for them to try to compete with somebody with a more expensive product to source. And in this case, I mean, you have less competition and like you said, higher, profit margin so these are all advantages that you should consider because if it's very cheap you have a lot of competitors because anybody can go and source it you know, and try to compete with you when it's more expensive they're going to think twice before they do that because it means higher investment at the beginning that's that's a good point and actually studies have shown sorry to sorry to jump back in but studies have shown actually that people are not always inclined to go after the cheapest product they're going after the best value proposition so anyone who's out there building a brand, build the value proposition to command the price point you need. Because if you build the, if you build that properly, if you get that message across correctly and you resonate with the right targeted demographic, they'll pay the price you need them to. You don't have to be the cheapest to be successful. And I think a lot of brands, when they're just starting out, 
they think they've got to be the cheapest and be a great product. You simply don't have to be. What you have to do is sell a good message with that product and frankly, believe in it. Don't, don't do it cynically. Yeah, guys, uh, all uh, I agree with basically every, uh, everything. Uh, I think uh, my, my input here is uh, depends also a bit on the brand. So are you a, a brand that focuses on multi-channel? Uh, then you can look at Amazon, for example, as a, a product search engine. If you look, for example, in Germany, I think 65% of the product searches start on Amazon. So I think you need to look also on, okay, I want to use Amazon to get the visibility, but I'm making my margins at other channels. So it's it really based exactly. on uh, yeah, your your plan as a brand, a plan as a company uh, to to decide where you want to make your your margins. But Do you I, see, by the way, guys, last point: um, make sure you make margins because otherwise it's going to be stressful, painful, and if you're unable to make margins and you're thinking that just scaling and growing more. Uh, volume is going to make it a profitable business. In reality, more the bigger, the more, more problems appear that you were not expecting before. So before you reach a maturity in your new scale of business, you're going to also pay for that learning curve. Sales are vanity, profit is sanity, as they say. Yeah, yeah and just just one thing, you know, my wife never asked me about my revenue. She asked for my profit at the end of the month. So. You know, listen, listen to your wife's husband. You know, <laughs> they know what they're talking about. I think your wife is talking to my wife. Yeah, I so think they, they all yeah, they are they similar, different right? They are similar, so to speak. Yeah. Yulia, there is a difference. <laughs> by the way, no, I Yulia, always ask for profit because I know some people who make millions in revenue. And then their profit is something that uh, a manager in a normal office in Germany will make, not even a senior manager or a, a, you know or anything like this. And then I tell this guy, look, if you're gonna go and become a managing director of this company, you're gonna make four or five times the money. Why are you doing your Amazon business when you're making no money? You're literally recycling. You're spending. We say in Russian, like you're spending your. Um, your cells, your, uh, you know, angry cells and your stress cells, you're literally wasting yourself away for nothing. There needs to be a result. You need to be going towards something. If that doesn't change, whether you need to change the path or adjust the way you're doing things, it's as simple as that. Hard to do, but as simple as that. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think it's, it's hard to do because it's basically telling an entrepreneur not to be an entrepreneur, right? Are you often that much driven that you always have a sort of a vision uh, that doesn't really make, make sense. So I think if you are such an entrepreneur, and there are a lot, I'm also a little bit uh, just like uh, myself like that, make sure you have a, an, a team uh, next to you that understands the margins, understands the finance, so they can actually see it. You make sure that you're the plan that you are developing, so for example, an exit, those make, make sense. So, uh, or, Talk to Julia, make sure that she also is going to put you straight. It's going yeah, yeah. No, I just, think, yeah, yes, go ahead. Just to add something, Julia. So just one thing, though, we're actually what every all of us are saying is right, but probably Matt, Steve, and Julia are going to confirm in some categories, you cannot uh, obviously continue to sell. You cannot actually reach a level until you don't work without profit margin for some time. For example, supplements. I've heard that first, the supplement category. So you guys can tell me if this is right or not, because my business was in the supplements for 10 years. That's why actually I exited because it was getting more and like harder and harder to be profitable. And I've heard from people that in some markets, you need to obviously work without profit for two years. So we have, you need a huge investment to actually stay on, on fault. But of course, I mean, that might be just information that they got. What do you say, guys? About the, the, what do you say, guys, about like the quality of the products in Europe? Like, because you know, Germany and Italy is one of the biggest manufacturers in the world for high quality products normally. So, does the end consumer in Europe, in general, looking for more high end quality products compared to the US? All of the consumers are looking for a free product, but that costs like that is of an exceptional quality. In general, if you produce in Europe, you can 
I mean, that's not a problem. It will take you a little bit more nerves in the process, but everything can be established. Uh, what we've noticed is uh, our products, our second brand is all made in Germany. Uh, we made this decision um, absolutely uh, on purpose because we wanted to produce closer to the market where we sell. We wanted to use this as marketing because we can sell for a higher price. And okay. we also use eco environmental things in our marketing that we're not shipping from China, from all over the world. We're shipping close to the market. Our turnaround time, it's five days or 10 days in production and we can start selling, right? So we literally like two weeks and we can have the money already coming back. So this is tremendous. You have a, a very high amount of people. I speak for Germany um, specifically because I am located in Germany and this is our main market. You have a lot of people who will be buying higher priced items and they will buy them on Amazon as well. Uh, they don't mind spending the money, whether it is cosmetics, whether it is furniture, whether it is very, very fancy uh, vitamins, supplements with gold inside or something like this. So, yes, there is definitely a market for this and it's growing from what we have seen. Yeah, I, I'd say the the analysis that we've we've seen and and the trends that that I think are becoming more and more apparent is that the younger demographics, our generation and the generations below us, um, they are moving far more to sustainability and to products that don't have a, a high ecological footprint. So products that are more green, that are more sustaining, they're moving away from fast fashion, cheap fashion, throwaway items, and those types of products inevitably need to be built to a higher quality for them to meet that purpose. So I think the market is shifting quite naturally towards slightly better products for a slightly higher price point because there's this understanding from the younger audience that they want to feel that they are being ecologically positive with their purchases. And they're, 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 they're purchasing a lot more with that sort of ethical and moral backbone. We're seeing that the, the brand message that's resonating a lot more is when it's around green, sustainability, full cycle environment. And you know, you see um, France and 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 Italy and, and Germany rolling out these requirements to have, you know, barcodes for sort of sustainability and 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 recycling. It's all moving in that direction. And the good news is it indirectly that direction forces products to probably be built better and survive longer and also be recyclable. So it's it's sort of a shift, I think, indirectly towards higher quality from that um from that vein of thought right so uh, before we go on to the next subject i just remind to all our audience here first by the end all of our speakers will give some kind of a cool offer to everyone so uh, keep in mind and stay tuned with us and uh, if anyone has some question please drop it in the chat box and our speakers will uh, gratefully answer those by the end of the session. So let's talk about now maybe something that Nick is more like experienced in, in, te in terms of compliance and tax regulation to Europe. So Nick, give us some insight. If you are now a seller and you want to enter into the EU market, what should you do as the first step in order to start a business there? Uh, I mean, to start selling in Europe, actually you need to do like a few steps. I would say five steps, you know. The first is to check your product compliance. I mean, because in the USA, as far as I know, you need to be like compliant only if you're selling food or supplements. So the FDA in Europe, you need to have, have plastic tax in France and Germany. So it's, it's different in each market. So before you start doing anything, I need to talk with a product compliance partner. You know, I have several of those. I believe uh, Steph, they can do that as well, if I'm not mistaken. And, and this is the first thing. This is like the gate opener. If they tell, okay, that's it. That's what you need to do. You need to do it because otherwise you're going to get spent. You're not going to be selling in Europe. So this is the first step because sometimes it takes a few months to get the clearance for that. So second part, VAT. To import stock in Europe, you need VAT. You need to, to start selling in Europe. You just need one VAT. You don't need multiple ones. It's going to take a few months. So in the meantime, you would need to arrange the custom logistics to actually import your stock to Europe. Then the last thing that you're gonna do is obviously need to do the translation and localization. We, we covered this topic before that, but you just need to remember, check your product compliance, apply for a VAT, 
take care of the like the logistics part, which Amit are doing. Uh, I believe Steph is helping out with that as well. Customs as well. And then, you know, the last part is the localization. And to, to answer it as quickly as possible, where should you start? You should start in Germany for a few reasons. Uh, the, the third largest market in the States after US and Japan. In, in Germany, they don't require fiscal representation. Fiscal representation is an insurance for non-EU companies which need to be paid so you don't skip and uh, decide not to pay the VAT. You know, in Germany, they don't have such insurance for, for, for I, I have no idea for what reason, but it's just cheaper for you guys. Another reason, if you're an English speaking uh, company coming from the UK, which is non EU right now, or the USA, Australia, New Zealand, the German tax authorities are going to accept documents in English. So you don't need to do translation, which is a relief for you guys. And probably the last, but not the least, is that Germany is located in the center of Europe. So it's an ideal starting and dispatch point from the logistic point of view. You're closer to almost any of your EU clients. And I mean, that, that, that's like as short as I can explain it, but I like it simple. And this is what, what are the steps that you need to over, overtake. But of course, I, I'm going to have Steph, Matt, and Yulia just give more updates because I might have missed something, to be honest. Next, next somebody drop a, a question, which I know the answer, but maybe I give you guys to answer. Uh, the, the question is, if somebody somebody mentioned here that uh, you, need, you only need one VAT, uh, can, the, can somebody clarify? So I'm meaning what, what they basically okay, asking. Okay, sure. I would ask is, if you can use one URI and if you need a specific VAT per each country. Uh, I'll explain you know, what, I, what I mean about the one VAT. You know. uh, the, the thing is the following, you know, if you go to Amazon, Amazon is going to tell you, okay, go and do the money. You're going to need five or seven VATs, which is total bullshit because Amazon makes money from fees, you know. So the more VATs you have, the more FBA uh, workouts you're going to use, the more money you're going to make. But this is not the smart way because VAT application takes di di different time in different markets. So you might have your VAT in, in like in Germany, you, you might be waiting a few more months for Spain. So you're going to get frustrated. You're not going to be happy. So... The smart way to do it is just to choose one market. Before Brexit, UK was the go-to market for anybody expanding to Europe. Right now it's Germany because of Brexit. And the reason why you need only one VAT is because uh, Amazon is working, it's, it's so, the so-called dim subpar. A non-EU company selling on Amazon doesn't need to pay the VAT because Amazon is gonna collect the VAT and they're gonna pay that to the tax authority. So it's, it's actually easier for you. And of course, you also cannot avoid paying VAT, which is good for the tax authorities. But, and the thing is you can use Amazon to make sales and deliver to clients across the whole European Union. And you're gonna use this, the Amazon OSS application to do that. I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go into details, but just believe me now, this is the cheapest and easiest way. You start with one VAT in Germany, you start selling to people. Like Matt said, each market needs to be localized. You see how your sales are doing in France and Italy. Once you have a validation that your sales are doing well, then it would make sense to set up a separate VAT in a warehouse, either FBA or a free PO, it doesn't matter, in Italy or France, and then you must get a second VAT. But to keep it simple and to keep it as cheaper as possible, you just need one VAT to start selling across the whole European market. Uh, the whole European Union on Amazon is easier because you don't need to get something which is called OSS. If you're showing, selling D2C, you would need to have the VAT plus the OSS, which would allow you to sell to uh, B2C clients across the whole union. But I mean, I, I think some people might have questions, but that does the truth, the only truth and nothing but the truth. This is the way how you should do it. Of course, unless you're a big brand and you have a lot of money, you would like to establish yourself on more markets, which is not smart, but you have the money so you can do it if you want. I know. Will be happy because we're going to sell more VATs at scale attack. But if it was me, I would not do it that way. Right. Cool. Uh, so we we talk about the subject a little bit, but maybe maybe Yulia or Steph or Matt would like to elaborate a little bit more about it. Like sourcing products uh, for Europe, is there a difference between it to to sourcing products to US or other markets in general? 
Well, the import is a little bit different. Um, so, for example, what when you, if you're, for example, purchasing uh, manufacturing your products outside of European Union, you will require an EORI number. This right. is European Economic Blah Blah abbreviation. So basically, this is an ident identification number that a company gets, so the company can import the product, right? So it can because you're going to be an importer of record, like uh, they have in US. Yeah. In general, um, actually, sourcing if you're doing if you're selling in Europe, it's very advantageous for you to do sourcing in Europe as well, because again, for example, Nick was in supplements. There's all of the supplements that are produced in Europe. You can produce them uh, in UK. You can produce them in Germany, Latvia, Lithuania, anywhere. Glass products, textiles, uh, kids products. So there are so many different opportunities. And if you want to go maybe a little bit cheaper or you want to go for some plastic products, you can go, for example, to Turkey, right? And your delivery time is extremely fast, seven to 10 days trucking. If you want to ship it by air, it's going to be like three or four days. So there are tons of opportunities. And if you're manufacturing your products within the European Union, obviously you don't need to pay an import tax, which is, uh, you know, offsets. So if you produce in China, you ship it to Europe, you pay the product price, you pay the shipping costs, you pay the VAT on the product and you pay the import tax. So a lot of people uh, are saying, oh, but manufacturing products in Europe is a lot more expensive. Yeah, but deduct the shipping costs because it's going to be a lot lower. There's not going to be an import tax and you're kind of even, even out basically to what you can manufacture in China. And on a lot of occasions, we actually seen prices, you know, manufacturing in Europe is cheaper than manufacturing the same products in China. Um, if you are, for example, in uh, into cycling, uh, cyclists clothing, right? The uniform is made out of very special material. This material yeah. is actually only produced in Italy. So the Chinese manufacturers, they ship the material from Italy to China, manufacture the products and then ship it back to Italy and sell it under made in China, rather than you can do the whole procedure within Europe and it will be cheaper. Just use the labor in Poland, for example, or in, uh, I don't know, Estonia or something like this. And you get the cheaper pricing. So don't be afraid to look outside of the box, especially considering political situations, uh, even though Blinken has met with our wonderful Chinese head, uh, head, head of China, Kind of thing uh and they said situation is great we love each other very much uh but in, not not very much but you know uh political situation is very unstable uh we've seen what happened with the prices during COVID for shipping costs where one container was twenty thousand dollars uh for 40 high cube whereas now you can get it for port to port, uh, port, only. port, to port only julia port to port exactly uh yes. there's so many different off like so we need to consider political situation and you need to consider the diversification. Uh, don't put all of your eggs in one basket. If China closes down, you need to make sure that you can get your products from somewhere else. We had a lot of our products were stuck in China with, uh, for our first brand. And we had some customers who had open over orders for 500K, for 1 million, for 2 million. They placed orders and factories closed down and there was nothing they could do. If they had... A backup in a different country, they would have continued selling, at least for some time. Yeah, yeah. just to add something, you know, since you mentioned I was selling supplements for 10 years, I never ever sourced anything from China. I'm from Bulgaria originally, I was selling across the whole European Union, minus like UK and Germany. I was sourcing from the UK and even the USA in the beginning. Our And this is what we're doing. You know, we have a project for a new brand, you know, we didn't bother with the brand registry. It was the Wild West back then. So what we did, we build the landing page, we do a test campaign for a day, we get the validation that our products is being sold, we, we extend the, uh, the, actually the copy to the manufacturer in the UK, like the label, we ordered and we get like 50,000 units in like three weeks. And the people who ordered, we told them, sorry guys, we're, we're out of stock, we're gonna deliver that in, in three weeks. And from from tasting the product to launching that, it takes fruits. Of course, that's total nonsense nowadays, but it confirms what Julia was saying. You know, there is no borders here. There is no ports, nothing, you know. You order from the EU, you deliver it to clients in the EU. So for high value products, it makes sense to do it here. 
because once I listened to my partners for a new product, we tried to source from China and waited four months. And we didn't sell a single unit, you know, after that. So that's another story, but, you know, uh, keeping it local and having like a, like a backup, it's always it's, it's always great, you know. If you have like, you can even compete with your uh, like suppliers like that. You tell them, okay, you know, we can test suppliers. You can you as an expert in that, but I like what you're saying because I mean, just to keep them easier to the client is much better, you know. Especially since Europe has has the highest average uh, value for orders, you know, on one. I think this is something that Steph told in one of our webinars, if I'm not mistaken. So Nick, also I, the whole... I, will add, I will add one line there just about what you and Nick advise that like the cycling normally when you manufacture sourcing in China and you ship to the US so the cycling is about let's say 45 to 50 days from pickup to delivery selling in Europe to Germany uh, going from China it can be easily 75 to 19 days because just the transit time port to port only is much longer compared to US to China. So the cycling of your cash flow is much longer. That's meaning that it's, it, 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 will, it will force you to have a much stronger cash flow in order to sell in Europe if you're sourcing in China. So sourcing and produce in Europe and ship it to Europe in two, three, five days is significantly, significantly huge advantage. And yeah, I think all of this is true. And I would just simply add that um, if anyone who's worked with China for years, they know that year one, they're, they're, you're, you're their best friend. They'll they'll give you a great price. If things start to become successful, years two and three, they're going to hike that price up and make it very hard suddenly and eat away at your margin because now they know that they've got you hooked. And the other point I think that is really important is just simply IP theft, counterfeit. It's yeah. much harder to police China manufacturing, just given the red tape, the culture over there. The, 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 you know, it's just it's so much easier for them to to steal your product, steal your idea, and 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 then suddenly, before you know it, you're competing with your own good idea. Whereas in Europe, there's far more safeguards and rules and restrictions, and there's also just a mentality to, in my opinion, act a little bit better on that from an ethical standpoint. So you can control the IP of your product a little bit better. Steph? No, I, I, I agree. I think it uh, depends also a bit which stage you are as a company, but I think uh, having flexibility on using your, your capital because you have lower MOQs because of the shipments, for example, that needs to fill up a complete container or uh, the production time, those, time, those flexibility is useful when you are still hustling and playing the game. Uh, all the cash that you can use to play around, that's important. Also, because I think it uh, depends on where you are as a company, it's quite difficult to, let's say, envision your future sales. And, uh, and a, a mistake there, too much or too low, uh, and with long deliveries can have a devastating impact on your, on your business in general. Right, so great stuff, uh, everybody. So before we're gonna summarize this webinar and give some special gifts to our audience, uh, maybe one last sentence or insight from each one of you about selling in Europe. Julia, Nick, Matt, Steph, would you like to add something? Uh, yeah. Yeah, actually I will add something though. The webinar would be useless for you guys if you don't make the next step and just do it yourself, you know, because we're just giving you an advice, but you need action, you know. A lot of people plan too much and don't do anything, you know, my advice is just to give it a try, of course. Uh, especially, you know, if you have a great product, like Matt said, if you have something unique, you know, you just need to try your idea. And of course, there are some tools that you can test to validate your ideas. I'm not going to mention the tool names, but there is a lot of softwares for product research. So you can even start check, what, I mean, if your assumption is right and your product is great by checking who is your competitor in the market. Of course, Steph can help out with that. Matt can help out. I'm not sure if you guys do that, but a lot of people can help out to see if what you think makes sense. But of course you would need to start and get in touch with Julia and order your samples and start selling, you know, of course.
Yuria? I think I'm fully supporting Nick. I've seen tons of people. I met some people two years ago and I meet them now again at some trade show somewhere and I'm asking you, so where are you at? Oh, we're still thinking we're like, like, dude, you might have potentially lost hundreds of thousands, if not million in sales because you're going for perfection. Don't go for perfection. Start, test it out. If it's going to fly with some, you know, maybe not perfection, some bad reviews, that's okay. You can improve because we improve in our Amazon listings all the time. My husband looks at it every three months. The pictures are shit. I'm like, you just done them, but they're shit. I feel like the trend has changed. So don't constantly go for perfection. Start off with something. Don't be afraid of exploring new opportunities and doing something that others are not doing. For example, sourcing yeah. outside of China, um, you know, using different strategies, being think outside of the box. And always uh, also don't always rely on your opinion. Uh, give you an example. The product that uh, with the second brand, what we launched, uh, the best seller was the product that we thought would have the lowest sales because our perception of it was very different from the customer perception. So always make sure to do a very good A-B testing within some random people. And there are apps and websites for this um, before you start launching. Because if you don't like something, it doesn't mean it's not going to sell. I've seen things sell for millions and they're horrible. Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah my, my last point is, um, uh, don't don't start in just one country. Uh, uh, the average brands that we work 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 with are going live in five countries, and um, uh, obviously it costs a, a little bit more, obviously, but you're diversifying risk and opportunity. Uh, or why why is that important? Because in, imagine if you make a plan to go live for one country and it fails, you're not going to start investing in the second country anymore. So you need to diversify a bit more and then you're going to see that a product will sell well in a country and you can start building building on that uh, instead of just saying, okay, Germany is the biggest market, let's go to Germany. Uh, I would not uh, go with that route. Uh, basically, none of our brands sell in less than, than, than three countries. So that's, I think, an important, uh, important part. And also, if you're already selling on Amazon, you already had a learning curve and your product already went to a maturity phase and you already have to reviews. So once you go live in a new country, you can use that. So you're probably much quicker able to get some results simply because also the reviews want to give trust to the local consumer. Because also, and that's my last point, in, in US it's quite common to have hundreds of reviews, hundreds of five star reviews. In EU it's not because there's 60% less competition shattered over nine countries. So there are not a lot of products uh, that has thousands and thousands of reviews. So if you have a product that has hundreds of five star reviews and you launch in a country, it immediately sees a really big brand. So uh, take that advantage and uh, like everybody says start investing start uh, start growing uh, spread your risks spread your opportunities and you will succeed uh, over time also. Matt uh, I would simply say just don't be cynical yeah. believe in what you're doing believe in the brand be believe in the integrity of the brand believe in the message behind the brand believe you want to deliver something of value to an audience and approach this from a, a, a passion and, and, a, and a belief in what you're doing. Um, it's it, Everyone wants to make money. Obviously, we all need to make money. We're all on here to make money. But but at the end of the day, it's you're going to burn out faster. It's going to become a harder, more cynical life if, if you don't truly believe in what you're selling and what you're doing. So, um, believe in your brand believe in what you're trying to build and be integral about it and, and everything will become a little bit easier the best brands that i've worked with and the ones that i'm most excited to work with are not the big fortune 500 companies and the, the, the household names i mean they're great to work with don't get me wrong but the ones that excite me are the ones where there's real passion and belief in what they're doing they're bringing a product they believe is ethically good is better has a great story to it those are the ones that do well. Those are the ones that resonate. So, so believe in what you're doing. Amazing, guys. It was super, super uh, insightful. And thank you, everybody. So now is uh, the special time to give like special offer to our audience. 
So, uh, Nick, we we'll start with you. What would you like to our uh, What would you like to share with our audience here? Okay, I mean, what I'm gonna share, I can share a lot of stuff, but uh, I'm gonna keep it simple. You know, we have an expansion to Europe package. So if anybody would like to expand to Europe, you know, and here is a, actually a secret. You might be EU company who expands from the EU to other markets in Europe. We're actually giving away uh, over 3,000 US dollars per brand. You know, this is from Hello Tax and a few other partners for part of the package, which, which we're covering everything, like product compliance, customs, all this kind of stuff. So if you want to expand Europe, I mean, we're going to give you like a, a boost with some extra discounts. And of course, I know everybody who can help you out. Some of those guys are actually here uh, in the meeting. And the other thing, which is for everybody here, plus uh, the people who are actually speakers, we're going to launch a, a SaaS tool for warm introductions. Uh, people here know me that I network a lot, a lot. I connect people. So we're going to have a tool to facilitate those introductions. and. And the biggest surprise is going to be free for now, of course. So we call it a networking on steroids. You can connect with people, warm, do warm interactions and grow your network. And it's going to be much, much easier. No, no spreadsheets, no emails. I just going to share like a link here in my context. See who you like to meet, put the request. You can, I can do the same on your, on your end, but that will be live in two weeks. So uh, that's what I'm going to be giving away today. And of course, you need to get in touch to benefit from those, of course. Great. Yuria? Um, actually, yesterday we just launched a list of uh, discounts from all of the service providers. I think we have like 120 service providers on the list. Um, I can share the link with you. Uh, we don't get anything from this literally. Uh, so all of the service providers who are on the list, they give you a special offer and we don't get affiliate links or affiliate money or anything like this. We don't, we prefer this to be given to the people. And, uh, so this is just goes kind of to everyone. I think it can be useful. It's like, like all together, like worth about $9,000 in different savings and whatnot. And, uh, second, um, if you guys have any questions, um, uh, I think through an email, we can share a, a link for a Calendly. You can get a, a half an hour free consulting, right? So whatever problems you have, whatever advice you need in regards to sourcing supply chain or anything like this, you can get in touch with us and we can talk to you for half an hour, no payment, no sales, like, you know, pitch or anything like this. We will literally try to resolve your problem. I think this can be useful to the people. Yeah. More than useful, by the way. Hope so. Yeah. Steph, Matt, something in return to our community? Yeah. So I will, I will go. <laughs> so, what we do, we are Amazon operator. We basically open up a Europe uh, from end to end. And what we will do for the audience here is that we will do market research to basically see the size of the market and who are your top competitors, what kind of revenues they're doing and some more background about their history. One, and secondly, uh, we will, uh, instead of uh, go, you can go live in five countries uh, for the price of three countries. So we are, you are basically free launching two additional countries based on the analysis that we're doing. Great. Yeah, I think I'll probably have to offer a very similar thing to everyone else here. I'm going to offer you my time and any support I can. 30 minutes, anytime you want to speak, we can talk about anything you want. Amazon, eBay, any of the channels, your plans, your expansion goals, your problems of the past. And, um, you know, if, if that includes just doing an audit of your listings together on the call together right there, we can do that. If that's just to talk about big strategy, we can do that. If I don't have the answer, I'll ask our team. We've got over 30 very smart, intelligent people with combined decades of experience in the company. So yeah, let's just talk about whatever you'd like to, and I'll just try and help for free as best I can. Great. By the way, all these offers will be in the description of the under our YouTube channel of Pobox. Uh, so for myself, from Pobox company, I would like to thank Yulia, Steph, Matt, and Nick, for your valuable time, for your valuable insight, and thank you all our audience. Thank you very much for this webinar. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Mitch, for hosting it. You know, you, you did the hardest job. I know it's yes. yeah. for yes. a fact. I mean, speaking yeah, is easy. Like fucking head. 
I was sweating yeah, like five Speak, speaking is easy. Organizing is hard. So thanks again yeah. for inviting us and enjoy the evening, everybody. You know, thank and you. We're all in Europe. Or so morning, right? or <laughs> yeah. or afternoon, or middle you. of the night. Info so, to you. Yeah. That's the last. That's okay. the last thing. Yeah. <laughs> bye, guys. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, bye. Thanks all. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yes. Bye.